Thank you, Madam Chairperson, the distinguished Honorable Chancellor of the Judiciary, the distinguished Chief Justice of our country, my cabinet colleague, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Justices of Appeal, Justices of the High Court, and with your kind permission, there are so many distinguished persons here. I want to stand upon the protocols so elegantly established by those who spoke before me. I want to thank, begin by thanking the judiciary for affording me an opportunity to share this momentous occasion and to confirm me with the privilege of sharing this podium. This is a small, simple, but very historic ceremony as it celebrates another milestone in our criminal justice system. As we heard from the Honorable Chancellor, the Court of Appeals established since 1966 in that singular edifice, which is on the front of our program. And that singular edifice, constituting of a singular court, constituted for decades our Court of Appeal, which for decades was our apex court until the advent of the Caribbean Court of Justice. And even thereafter, we had that singular courtroom being used as our court of appeal in an ever-expanding litigious environment. After a while, as expected, it would have become not feasible anymore. So I recall distinctly when the initiative began during my tenure as Attorney General between 2011 to 2015, then Chancellor, the Honorable Carl Singh, engaged myself, Bishop Edgil, at that time, Prime Minister Sam Hines. His office was located here as well. I think we sought the assistance of the Lands and Surveys Commission in getting the historical records out, in understanding what the judiciary was claiming was an encroachment by the executive on judiciary's property. So we had that first engagement and then we left government and there was apparently an impasse. And when in 2020 we returned to government, Chancellor Cummings Edwards re-engaged us and whatever differences existed were collapsed in the interest of the public and the interest of the state. And we are now celebrating that conciliated and mediated position. I see Teddy was smiling when he hear the word conciliation, mediation. So we are here today to celebrate Diana's second courtroom or Diana's Court of Appeal having its second courtroom. And this is only going to be one in many transformational interventions that will take place shortly. I have re reiterated on many occasions, and I will repeat myself here, that our government is acutely aware of the fundamental role that the judiciary must play 
and our institutions of justice must play in the transformation which is taking place across the landscape of our country. In fact, we are of the firm view that the judiciary, law and order, and the institutions of justice are the foundation upon which modern society rests. And that is why we have never hesitated in partnering with the judiciary once there are resources available to execute both capital projects as well as current projects and initiatives. And both the Honorable Chancellor and the Honorable Chief Justice have graciously recognized the government's role and the way that the two arms of the state have coordinated, cooperated, and collaborated in many, many endeavors going forward. As I speak now, we have courthouses being built where we never had courthouses before. On the east bank of the Marara, we have three courtrooms, that, three courthouses that either have begun construction or one will commence and two have already commenced. Friendship, Suzdaik, and Providence. Across the river, we have Parfait Harmony. We have, we are going to turn the sod, accompany the Chancellor and the Chief Justice and their team to visit a site at Tushin, where we will hopefully construct another magistrate court in Region 3 as Leonora and Vredenhoop can take off the workload on the west coast of the Marara. Across the Esipebo River, we have already completed a new magistrate's court at Bartica. We have two being constructed in Region 1, one at Mabaruma, one at Port Kaituma. We shall soon commission the Madia Magistrates Court in Region 8. And we have already done brand new edifices in other regions of our country. So there is a physical transformation taking place. When the government speaks about a physical transformation, we are not only speaking about the transformation from an executive perspective, we are speaking about the transformation across every divide in our country. And as I said, the judiciary will never be left out. And that is why we are partnering with the judiciary again in terms of bringing within its repertoire the most advanced technological facilities. The Honorable Chancellor and Chief Justice alluded to the, the e-filing project, a multi-million dollar software which we purchased from Singapore. And there are other such initiatives that we are working on. The Honorable Chief Justice spoke about e-payments. Well, the infrastructure, the statutory infrastructure is already in place with the E-Transaction Act. And there's something I'm going to speak about a little later. That E-Transaction Act allows all transactions that are being done manually to now be done electronically. What we need to do now is to fashion the platforms, the technological platforms 
and the Ministry of Finance and indeed central government will have to refashion its entire financial architecture to permit these e-transactions from becoming, you know, um, the more preferred method of transacting business at the level of central government. That will require an overhaul. So, I want the judiciary and of course the legal profession to have broken no doubt about the government's commitment to working with the judiciary to ensure that we have the most modern legal system in the Caribbean. It is already a recognized and an undisputed fact that we have by far the most aggressive legislative agenda, if not in the Commonwealth Caribbean, perhaps the entire Commonwealth. And General Counsel Justice Schumann can attest to that. Other countries in the Caribbean marvel at the speed at which we are progressing. As I stand here before you right now on the floor of the Parliament, there is a brand new arbitration bill, which is the most modern expression of arbitration law in this hemisphere. We use the CARICOM model, and then we modernize it with interventions from law firms such as Gibson and Dunn, of New York and London and Arnold and Porter from Washington DC and Paris. Major law firms dealing with arbitration. Then we ensure that we put clauses in there that will allow for international arbitral centers or centers of offering arbitral services to come and locate in Guyana. Of course, we adopted the gold standard for arbitral, arbitral awards, the UNCTRAL rule promulgated by the, United, by the UN General Assembly. That bill will be debated Friday coming in the National Assembly and passed. We have also on the floor of the National Assembly the plea bargaining and agreement bill. We tried the plea bargaining in Guyana in 2008 and it did not yield the type of results which we anticipated. And we examined it against existing models in the United Kingdom, in the United States where plea bargaining is a major method of resolving criminal disputes. 90% of the cases in the American criminal justice system are determined by plea bargaining. We looked at the various plea bargaining models in the Caribbean and we re reworked the entire bill. We now have that bill will allow for plea bargaining to be done even before charges are instituted. So it gives the prosecution a great latitude of power I believe that the bill, the power was misplaced in the previous bill in that it vested a lot of concentration of power in the judiciary. This time around, we have centered the power in the DPP office because the DPP office is the machinery for prosecution. And therefore, that office should be empowered to take charge of prosecutions and to determine, of course, with the other stakeholders, the victims, the accused person, and of course the judiciary. All plea deals have to be done before the judiciary. But we rearranged the focus of the powers, and we believe that we have addressed the main deficiency in that bill. Obviously, we have looked at other practical deficiencies and we have addressed them. So that is another bill that will um, be passed Friday, hopefully. Then, on the floor again, we have the abolition of paper committals. 
Again, we tried that with the Sexual Offenses Act in 2008. We had many challenges. The Court of Appeal resolved following a case from coming out of Antigua and going to the Privy Council that there is nothing unconstitutional about paper committal. It was felt that the refusal to allow cross-examination at the preliminary inquiry stage would render the fair trial provision in the Constitution effective. I think Mr. Bacchus himself argued that point. Unfortunately, he was overruled at the Court of Appeal following the decision of the Privy Council. So, and you have had many other challenges in the Caribbean. So, paper committal is now a part and parcel of our criminal justice system across the region. And the Caribbean Court of Justice in particular emphasized to us, emphasized to the judiciary, that we have to come on board with these facilities that are already extended in the rest of the Caribbean. So that's another important statutory mechanism that's on the floor that we may be debated again Friday. Then we have sentencing guidelines. The consultant worked with the legal profession, worked with the judiciary. We had invaluable inputs from the judges and I believe the magistrates as well. And that um, initiative is now in its concluding stages. I have a consultant working on a new evidence act. We have an 1893 evidence act and we have made piecemeal um, amendments to it to accommodate the massive technological changes that have taken place in the, con in the world. You can't do that anymore. Why keep patching it all the time? So a brand new comprehensive evidence act is going to replace our current legislation in that regard. Um, Cybercrime legislation, that's a major issue now across the globe. Our Joanne Bond and Mr. Shala Passad, our officer at our New York office at the UN, are leading the Caribbean's initiative being part of a UN General Assembly initiative to craft a new cybercrime convention that will regulate all members of the United Nations. And from that convention will come a model statute, a model bill. Joanne and Trishala are leading the Caribbean's uh, representation in that regard because they are specifically working with a team to craft the Caribbean model bill in that regard. I mean, I can continue to speak here for a very, very long time on the many, many initiatives that we are working on, but I don't want to overstay my, my welcome. Um, the law reports. Only this afternoon, just before I came, I approved the format for the law report 2008 to 2021 law reports of Guyana so that the national printers can now go ahead to start printing. So you would recall that we had 20, oh, 1977 to 2007, that was the last set of law reports done. So and we left it from 207. So we, I picked up that slack and we are doing from 208 to 2021. It would have been done already, but I wanted the 2020, 2021 period to be included because we had some major decisions coming out of that infamous five months period, which I want to be part of 
the law reports. So we should have our law reports, hard copies, ready for distribution in the next couple of months. Obviously, we're going to have soft copies as well. We have to work out the arrangements, how that will be made available, because you know what the tendency is? When lawyers hear that there are soft copies available, they don't bother buy the hard copies. And I would be left with a whole set of books. See, Mr. Stephen Fraser smiling. But he bought when he printed the last set, I remember. The laws of Guyana, as you know, we contacted that undertaking, a massive one, to that company in Anguilla that offers that type of service, the only place in the Caribbean that does that. We got a lot of assistance from the Impact Justice Project out of Cave Hill Campus Barbados, headed by Professor Newton. And I want to recognize the efforts of Professor Newton, both in the law reports and the law revision exercise. This time around, of course, we are starting from 2012 to 2022, I think. December 2022. I hope I got the dates right. That's the period. Of course, you will recall that the 2012 exercise, well, the exercise that concluded in the 2012 revised laws had to do a massive undertaking dating back to 1977 because that was when the last revision took place. The exercise was understandably overwhelming and many mistakes were made, not many mistakes, having regard to the nature of the exercise. Mistakes were made, there were omissions made, and as soon as that exercise concluded, I had resumed, well, I had started an initiative headed by assistance headed by a, a gentleman from Justice Zulu from Africa who was lent to me by CARICOM and we began an exercise to look back at the 212 two revision to identify all the mistakes and the omissions. So we have that and then of course that exercise did not incorporate most of our subsidiary legislation. So those are omitted. So there's a second parcel we have to include. And then, of course, we did the revision from 2012 to, with, in relation to all the bills that we passed from 2012 to 2022. So it's another massive undertaking. But we are at the concluding stages. There were institutional delays, as expected, because in finding, the, in particular, the subsidiary legislation, the regulation, was not an easy task. We had to go to UG, Cave Hill, in Parliament, we even are looking now in certain offices in London, colonial office in London, to look at some, if we can get some of those that were excluded. So that is a work in progress. We are also, the government of Guyana, through the Ministry of Legal Affairs and the Caribbean Court of Justice, funded by the IDB under the Support of Criminal Justice Project, will be hosting a criminal justice conference in Guyana in July on the 11th and 10th, on the 10th and 11th of July. I believe a safety date has already been sent out. So we are going to be the host of a mega event. This is to follow 
what took place last year in Barbados. So we are hosting, along with the CCJ Academy of Law, the judiciary is part of the coordinating team, as well as I incorporated representatives from the Guyana Bar Association. <clears throat> we have to continue our education. We can be passing new laws and these new innovative changes and we, are, we don't have commensurate educational, conti continuous educational programs. So that is something that we have to work on. I know that a team came from the European Union, they met with me this morning, they went to see the DPP after meeting with me, and I believe they will be engaging the judiciary tomorrow. And I raised that as an issue. I said to them that we are making tremendous progress, but we need education. The new arbitration bill, for example, I've done a number of training programs inviting um, international arbitrators across the globe and the Caribbean, training lawyers, members of the bar. I believe the judiciary was also invited to some of the training sessions. So we have to ensure that we do training so that our magistrates will understand the new committal proceedings legislation and all the other legislation that I'm speaking about. So that is something that we'll have to concentrate on in the next few years going forward. A main component will have to be our continuous legal education because we are passing so many transformative legislation and you know judges are expected to just learn them just like that. My, my brother Bishop Edgel only Friday piloted the most impressive ar array of amendments to our Civil Aviation Act to improve our standing internationally, our airport facilities, and these are recommended by the international um, agencies. But whenever there is a problem, they will come to the judiciary for interpretation. And we have to find ways and means of educating our judges, finding the manuals, doing books that can help with the interpretation of the various pieces of legislation. I want to conclude by thanking the judiciary. They have done a remarkable job, Justice Chancellor Cummings and Chief Justice Roxanne George. It's one thing to get support from the government, but to conceive the ideas and to drive them and to complete these projects are not easy. The project, as you heard, the contract was signed in 2021 with a 14 months time frame for completion. Now imagine that's one contract and the judiciary is frustrated. The government does that 50 times a day. Every single contract that we entered into. I don't know, Bishop is here, he monitors contracts all day. I doubt whether very few are ever brought in, in time. That is why recently the government took a very informed decision to set up an apparatus within central government to allow for the quick review of contracts when they are breaches or their reliction or delaying completion and to forward it to a unit established in the Attorney General Chambers for there to be expeditious advice so that we can move the process forward. Yesterday was Mother's Day. 
I can tell you, because I spoke to many contractors on the phone this morning, 50% of the contractors across the country doing major contracts, they couldn't work today because yesterday was Mother's Day. Nobody turned up to work. That's, that's, that's a society that you, you, you function in. You try in your personal life to do your own construction and you will see how quickly you will age because of the stress and the frustration. There's no secret that Bishop... <laughs> I can't say it aloud before I get there too. There's another prominent, prominent gentleman in the government who shares the same here style like Bishop. And it has a lot to do with distress and delinquent contractors. So, again, we will be, government will be approaching the court in a lot of these matters, dealing with contract, but that is not to, in any way, invite any favors from the judiciary. It's just as we are speaking, and that's an important part of the narrative. We have to deal with the realities of the society in which we live. <coughs> and that is why I want to congratulate the Chancellor and the Chief Justice. You heard how many projects I outlined earlier in my presentation being undertaken simultaneously. And it is because of the aggression, the determination, and the management of Team Supreme, I think it's called, Team Supreme, performing supremely. So I think I should invite you to give them a round of applause for accomplishing this and the many tasks that they are currently undertaking. Madam Chancellor, Madam Chief Justice, members of the judiciary, thank you once again for affording me this opportunity and to members of the profession and invitees all, congratulations on the accomplishment of another edifice for our celebration and let me not detain you from physically inspecting the facilities that we are here to celebrate. Thank you very much for your attention.